Good evening. Tonight we will look at the third series of <coughs> Sermon on the Mount. And tonight the sermon title is The Misunderstood Meek. Well, when we think about meekness, we will always associate it with weakness. But really, is meekness equivalent to weakness? Well, tonight, as we explore this subject, and you will come to a positive conclusion that meekness is not weakness. So meekness, meekness has, has been misunderstood. In Matthew 5, <clears throat> chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 5 says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. First we see meekness contradicts the world's system. Because in, the, in this world, only the fittest survive. Now we know that in the animal kingdom, the lion, the leopard, the tigers, they are the leaders, they are the king, they are the kings of the forest, especially the lion. Why? Because the fetus survive. If you are weak, you will be eaten up. You will be devoured. So how can the meek, therefore, inherit the earth? It seems to be contradictory. Because our world system embraces strength and not meekness. <coughs> the world system advocates that only the powerful wins and it, to a certain extent it is true if you are powerful you have the way reader you have the means you will win you have the the advantage of an incumbent you know a lot of time you look at people in some office whether it's a uh, society chairman or maybe a political office the incumbent always has an advantage because they are powerful they have the way with them. now the world affirms the powerful the powerful has influence and rightly so the powerful has influence and so they have advantage but is it wrong to be powerful no actually it's not wrong to be powerful. I think we have to look at power in a positive way. We can use power in a, in positively, we can use and abuse power. And there are not a few who abuse the power entrusted to them. But they do have advantage if you are powerful. So when you are powerful, you have the upper hand, is it? And a lot of people think so, and sometimes you look around. The person who has now the power they are maybe making life miserable for many other people. They have no consideration. They have maybe no feeling, no compassion. They do as they want. What they think is right, they will just bulldoze through. They don't care because they are powerful. They have the upper hand. And the world promotes aggressiveness. Because the, if you are aggressive, then you win. If you are not aggressive, you will lose. The word says that you are, if you are humble, you will be bullied. So some people, very unfortunately, they have to put on a very bold front, a strong front, because they are afraid that if they don't display a bold front, a strong front, they will be bullied. But because the world thinks this way, the weak, the humble, the meek will be taken advantage of. So you must exert your right. I must exert my right. Is that so? <clears throat> Sometimes we teach people to exert their right. Maybe we, sh we should think deeper. Is that the right thing? 
Well, it's true that there are certain times you have to exert your right. But it is not true that all the times we exert our right. The proud also seems to be successful. Whereas the humble seems to be less successful. So people embrace us. People embrace us. Pride. Strength. Assertiveness. Aggressiveness. Now the world also admires the importance, there's one eye missing here. The importance. If you are an important person, the world admires you. And the world listens to the important people. I mean, anything wrong to listen to the important people? No, no, no. They must have some value before they become important, right? So it's not wrong to listen to the important people. But the world seems to venerate that we only listen to the important people. But that is also not true. Sometimes important people also talk nonsense. They spew nonsense. But you can have a humble person, a very simple person that will tell you some divine truth. And truth, the golden nuggets, can come from some very common person. I remember one time I was at <clears throat> a certain church as a service and the husband was giving testimony. You know, the husband was eloquent you know, and he seemed to have a little bit of eh, but he was eloquent. He was praising God, thanking God for all God has done for him. Good! And then standing beside him was his wife. Seems to be a simple lady not that eloquent, you know. We, we call them the aso aso type, you know. When her turn comes, when she opened her mouth, and when she spoke, wow, I tell you, I was impressed. Because the, she did not speak, she did not speak with that kind of eloquence like the husband. However, the simplicity and the content and the flow of the language was beautiful. Simple thoughts, earnest, straight to the point. They call it one needle see blood, yi zhen jian xue. So effective. But only the important people can speak well and speak important things, not necessary. The humble, the meek, can do that. Now the moment, the, the, the powerful things that if they lose the grip on power, nobody will listen to them and it is true also. I think in this world, how many people feel discouraged, especially you know, when some people, they, they step down from their position, they, be, they, they lost, they got lost. They just do not know what to do. Because suddenly they cannot wield any power. No one listened to them. Last time they, they control, they command a lot of people in the company. Now when this person go back home, he's controlled by the wife. <laughs> so he's all messed up. So because the moment you lose power, no one listens to you. So that's why they need to put on a strong front. So therefore, meekness, humility, gentleness, seems to be something not quite logical, not advantageous at all. Secondly, how does a meek person look like? I want to see how a meek person looks like. <clears throat> First, let me do some clarification. Right? We need to clarify. <clears throat> Meekness is not weakness. I emphasize again, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is actually strength under control. To be meek is strength under control. You have strength, but you put under control. You subject yourself under control. Not run loose. Become chaotic. Havoc. Secondly, meekness, this word meekness, in the Latin, in the Latin language, 
is very explicit. And meekness in Latin means mensuetus. Mensuetus. In Latin. It means what? It means used to the hand. It will give you a very vivid picture of a man caressing a horse. And the horse is used to the hand. Meekness. If that horse is a wild horse, you put your hand on, on, on the mane, it'll give you a horse kick. <laughs> so, Latin has a very beautiful, explicit description of meekness. Used to the hand. Man sweatus. In the Greek, the idea of meekness is a domesticate, domis, domestic, domesticated, domesticated horse. A horse that is domesticated, tame, not an untamed wild horse. Now, by the way, New Testament is written in Greek, and Latin language actually evolves, evolves from Greek. That's why they are very close. In fact, today, many of our uh, so-called professional jargon, you know, especially if you are a lawyer, you are a doctor, you know, when they come to certain jargon, they have to use Latin, you know, modus operandi, oh, famous, right? Oh, what is a more modus operandi? Now, see, it's Latin. In law court, you want to impress the judge, you use Latin. So Latin is a beautiful language. And in this case, Latin gives us a very nice, very explicit meaning of the word meekness used to the hand. Now, meekness is like a domesticated horse. There are two kinds of horse. There are two kinds of horse. One, a wild horse. And secondly, a tame horse. One untamed and one tame. Now, a wild horse has not much use. Because it's not controllable. Not controllable. And it has no achievement. Because you, you cannot control the horse. You cannot ride the horse. You cannot direct the horse, this wild horse, to do your bidding. Then this horse has no use, has no achievement. And the great potential that this wild horse has will never be realized. You know how sad? A wild horse has all the potential to do great things for the owner, for the master. But because it is untamed, it cannot control the horse's own tempo, their own characteristics, the one nature, the one nature in, he, in this horse, it becomes uncontrollable. And then this horse is of no use. On the other hand, a domesticated, domesticated, a domesticated horse can run distant. In fact, long distance, Chinese say, one day runs a thousand miles. But I think maybe the thousand is not really a thousand. It's a, you know, a hyperbole. It can run, it can run actually gallop long distance, maybe a hundred miles. It's a good horse, a uh, domesticated. Well, a, a, a domesticated horse when, 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 when in war time, in the battle, the horse can, when facing the cannons and the rifles and bullets and arrows and spear, you notice that this horse will still charge in front, fearless. Then you will think that a horse having been domesticated, it becomes meek, used to the hand, but it is fearless still. You see, the potential is realized. So now you begin to see the beauty of what it means to be meek. Meek is not weak at all. You see, a domesticated 
horse can carry heavy loads. They, they used to put hundreds of pounds or kilos of load onto a horse and then they, the horse can just ride through the mountains or mountain, mountain terrain. The horse has this capacity, this potential, this strength. A horse can also pull a carriage to transport people. So we are horse carriage. Those days when they don't have Ferraris and they don't have their MPV, they have horse carriage. And so a domesticated horse is full of use, achievement, fearless, useful. The strength is fully, and the potential is fully realized. So you see, being meek is not weak at all. Meek, meekness is a plus. Meekness has advantages. In fact, it's so beautiful, as I described to you. Thirdly, how do the meek inherit the earth? How do the meek inherit the earth? <clears throat> well, first of all, to inherit the earth, the meek will avoid unpleasant situations. Unpleasant situations are no fun at all in Proverbs 15 verse 1 says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Now a gentle answer turn away wrath. Is it not true? It's very true. If you, you have experience, I think all of us have experience about what? about quarrels you know how people start a quarrel see when two person are hugging they don't start a quarrel you know have you seen two person hugging and then they start a quarrel never a quarrel most of the time start is because of misunderstanding because of their inner feeling because of the hurt and most of the time because of a wrong word and the word used the wrong tone the wrong volume and then it stirs up all the emotion that's why the Bible exhorts us counsels us have a gentle answer it will turn rough away now, let me give you an example if you come home and then your wife asks you dear have you taken your dinner now how do you answer there can be at least two kinds of answers. Okay? Two kinds of answers. Let me give you the first one. The first one will be, I have not eaten yet. I have not eaten yet. You know the, notice my tone. Huh? I have not eaten yet. Soft, gentle, can be quite loving. Or, the husband can answer this way. I have not eaten yet. I see, same words. The tone is not the same. The speed is not the same. The word con the word contains what? Knives and dagger waiting to cut a person into stretch a person into pieces. So see these angry words were what? Will stir up a quarrel. Very soon the wife says, You're going to die. <laughs> you you could. Now you see how quarrels start? Quarrel never starts when two persons are lovey-dovey. Quarrel starts because of a wrong word, a harsh word. If a harsh word stirs up anger, a gentle word turns anger away. And if you want to have a pleasant, avoid unpleasant situation, learn to speak softly. Because harsh words really stirs up anger. And sometimes you're okay until you hear a word. And that word really row you, wakes you from your slumber, and then you are ready for a fight. See, and and when you have a harsh word and you are, you know, you are, you are all messed up, you are all bundled up emotionally. You see, you make situation very untenable, you make situation very unpleasant. Then such people 
obviously cannot inherit the earth, right? You want to inherit the earth, I want to inherit the earth. Then we have to create pleasant environment, pleasant situation. Secondly, <clears throat> God will guide and teach the meek, the humble, the gentle. In Psalms 25 verse 9 says, He guides the humble, the meek or the gentle in what is right and teaches them his way. Now, if they are not humble, if they are not meek and they are not gentle, are they teachable? Oh, they will not be teachable. Right? See, a lot of time, a person, an uh, 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 unteachable person is what? Someone who is full of pride. Someone who knows, who seems to think that I know better than you do. I'm not wrong, you cannot teach me. But you see, the humble, the gentle, the meek are the teachable ones. And when they are teachable, then God can guide them. Then God can guide them. If we don't listen, then God cannot guide. Now only the meek can listen. Most of the time the pride will what? Defend. They will argue. They will dismantle your what? Your thoughts. Your suggestions. So you see, God will guide the humble in what is right. And then teach them His way. Now God's way must be the best way. The Lord promises to guide the meek. So are you willing to be lead, led by God? To be guided by God? I, I want to be guided by God. And we have to be meek. And God promises to teach them too. God promises to teach them. And how wonderful that God is our teacher. Thirdly, the Lord will also sustain them. The Lord will sustain them. In Psalms 147 verse 6, the psalmist says, The Lord sustains the humble, but casts the wicked to the ground. These are serious words. The Lord sustains the humble. God will sustain. In short, the Lord will protect the meek. Whose pro protection will be the best? The best protection is not your life insurance. The best protection, no, although life insurance is important, by the way. But the best protection is not just your life insurance. Your best protection is not just your car insurance. Although it's good and it's necessary to have car insurance. But don't you think that if the Lord protects you, then you will not have accident, then you don't need to use that insurance? Don't you think it's better? So when the Lord protects the meek, and we are blessed. If you want protection, then be meek. It is necessary. It is of necessity that you and I have to be me so that the Lord can protect us. If not, we will run outside the, the, protect, the hedge of God's protection. We will run outside the hedge of God's protection. And God says, He will cast the wicked to the ground. Now, you see, this is interesting. God sustains us. God will cast the wicked to the ground. You know, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, and I, I love the passage that says, when your enemy comes, when your enemies come and attack you in one way, the Lord will cause your enemy to be defeated. They will come to attack you in one way, but they will find seven ways to escape. Now, you understand this verse I will analyze this verse carefully. It says, the Lord, the Lord will cause you to a victory over your enemy. The Lord caused you, caused me, not that I have the strength, but God gives me the strength. The enemy will come in one way to attack us, attack you and attack me, but the Lord will defeat them. The Lord will cause you to defeat them. 
so that they will find seven ways to escape. Now, who do the fighting? You and I do the fighting. But who gives the strength? The Lord supplies the strength. Wow, this is wonderful, right? So when the Lord protects, when the Lord says, I will cast the wicked to the ground, the Lord will help you and me to fight the battle. The battle is not ours alone. See, wonderful. But the condition is what? The meek. The Lord will protect the meek. And then lastly, we come to Moidi. The Lord will also defend the meek. The Lord will defend the meek. How does the Lord defend the meek? In Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 to 16. Now, in Numbers chapter 12, 1 to 16 is a long passage and tonight we really do not have time to read all of these 16 verses but let me narrate the story to you well it was a time when there was a time when Moses married a Cushite a woman from Cush and because of this Cushite marriage in, in verse 1 Numbers 12, verse 1 reads, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite women whom he had married. So, you see, the Jews have very strict marriage law. They, they, they choose very carefully who they married and who they married to. It's not social status that they are concerned, you know. Maybe they are, but that is not the ultimate. It's not rich or poor, financial status. Not social status, not financial status, but more so their ethnic status. They cannot marry outside their own ethnic group. The Jews must of necessity marry Jews. So in this instant, Moses married a Cushite woman. Now, this Cushite woman was a Gentile. And it is actually unthinkable for Moses to marry a Gentile. Now why? I have no answer. I really don't have the answer. And maybe Miriam and Aaron don't have the answer, but more than that, they spoke against Moses. They began to criticize Moses. They complained about Moses. And sometimes see, one thing leads to another. They were not happy with other things, but they used Moses' marriage to this Kushite woman as the platform to launch their attack. You know what they were not happy about? They were jealous of their brother, their younger brother. Remember, this Aaron is the elder brother and Miriam was the elder sister. But they complained. They said that is it only that God will only speak to you, to Moses and not to other people? Only to this one leader and not to other people? So see, what they were not happy was this. This is the real issue. So they used Moses' marriage to this Kushite woman as an ex excuse to launch their you know, attack. See, oftentimes people are like that. When they are not happy with certain things, they don't tell you the truth. They find a different platform to achieve their true unhappiness. They will never tell you their true unhappiness. This is the fallen nature of man, unfortunately. So this brother and sister, they complained against Moses because Moses married a Gentile. In verse 3, the Bible tells us that now the man Moses was very meek, more than all the people who were on the face of the earth. Now this is what the Bible described Moses. Moses was a great leader, we all know that. Moses was capable. He was tenacious, he was brilliant, he was courageous, 
He has all the other good qualities. But above all that, the Bible says, Now the man Moses was very meek, very gentle, very humble. So because he was humble, what happened? The complaint came. Now you see, complaint when you don't deal with it, it will start to fester. It will start to multiply. And in verse 4, very interesting. And suddenly, the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron and to Miriam, God said, come out you three to the tents of the meeting. Now in those days, they, Moses had set up the tents of meeting or the tabernacle in the wilderness. And that's where the presence of God dwells. God's presence dwells in the covenant, the holy of holies. And this is where God's presence was. And then God said, come to the tent of meeting. And we will have a four-way conference, okay? Three of you plus God. Three plus one conference. Maybe Zoom, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but it was not Zoom. It was virtual, virtual. Okay? It was not, is it virtual? No, no, it was not virtual. It was live. Okay, not virtual. Life. God was present. Moses was present. Miriam was present. Aaron was present. And God defended Moses. You know how beautiful it is when God defends for you? God defends you? And God defends me? Because Moses kept quiet. Moses was very meek. Moses did not rebut. Moses did not retaliate. Moses kept quiet because he was me. But you know what happened? God jumps out and defended Moses. Now that is the best. You know who you want to be your defense lawyer? Not the queen's counselor. Not the senior counselor. But God. If God is your defense counselor, you are blessed. I am blessed. God jumps out and defended Moses. See what an honor. What an honor when God personally defended his servant Moses. See, when someone are throwing, someone is throwing stone and hurting, complain, uh, abuse, untruth, all the accusation, allegation, etc., etc., and then God jumps up and defends you. What an honor! What an honor! And God spoke for his servant. But God spoke for what type of servant? The meek. Because Moses was the meekest of all men. That is the key. So you see, meekness is not weakness. To be meek does not mean, does not mean that you and I will be bullied. No. Meekness is, in conclusion, meekness is victory over ourselves. When you put your temperament, your fallen nature, like that of madam, under control, the rebellious lust of our lives, when we have victory, meekness is a victory over the victorious, victorious lust and also the our rebelliousness, our rebellion, that is meekness. You see, good management, when you have meekness, because you will keep the situation sweet, not unpleasant, then you manage the situation, you manage the environment, you, you manage the ambient of the situation, then good management contributes more to our comfort than great possessions. Is it good to have great possession? Oh, yes, not. It's not wrong to have good, great possession if you use it properly, use it to benefit those who are less well off. It's good. But to have good management of the environment, of the circumstances, of the people and circumstances, is better than to have possession. Why? We can have a lot of possession, but 
we may not live peacefully. We may not live, you know, you may consider it as comfortable, but actually it's not enjoyable. Let me give you one illustration. <clears throat> I believe you and I, every night we can sleep well. I hope you can sleep well. I sleep well, okay? Generally, we should sleep well. You know why? We've got nothing much to worry. We don't worry that, you know, the, the thief will come and, and steal this and steal that. Anyway, we don't have a lot of things for people to steal. So we don't have to worry. We can sleep sweet. We have sweet dreams. Because we don't have to worry. But you know, if you are a man or a woman of means, you know, the wealthy person, you know, their house are surrounded by security guards to protect them. Why? Because they are afraid that the enemies will come and rob them, kidnap them, steal their thing, do them harm. Why? You see, actually their environment are not that peaceful and not that comfortable. It's a lot of tension. And also a lot of CCTV, you know, looking, spying. And they cannot even dig their nose. You know why? Because too much camera, the security men in the control room can see they dig their nose. So they got no privacy. So you think it's comfortable? No, it's not comfortable. But the average person, if you are me, you have good management of the environment, of the circumstances, we are more comfortable. Therefore, we possess the earth. You think who possess the earth? I know of one person, not in a foreign country, I shall not tell you the country, the name of the country. By the way, he's a pastor. When he goes out of his house, he leaves his house, he has two, three cars. One go left, one go right, and one may go center. Yeah, identical, identical car. And nobody knows which car he is, he's in. Because he's afraid that people will assassinate him. And that country seems to be very wild and, and it's not safe. If you're prominent, maybe he's vocal, you know, he, he, he make enemy out of some some powerful people. So, so you see, you, you can be, you think that you're strong, you think that you're influential, you think that you are powerful, but actually, miserable life, right? And you and I, when we go out, we don't have to have three cars, one go left, one go right, and one go center, no? So you see, we can have our life all in control, the situation is in control, the environment is in control. See, the meek man is like a ship that rides at harbor. No, right at anchor rather. <clears throat> a ship that rides at anchor means the anchor is dropped. The ship is perhaps in port or in a lagoon, in a harbor. Anchor is dropped. And then the wind and the waves will move the ship. The wind and wave will move the ship. But the ship is never removed. It can be moved but never removed. You see, a meek person is like an anchored ship. The bad circumstances, blah, 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 all this may move us. The problem of life is like, you know, all the winds and all the waves. But because we are anchored, we have meekness, we are anchored in unto God. Then we are moved, but we are never removed. You see the difference? It's like a horse. When it is tame, all the potential will be exploited in a good way. All the potential will be realized. Well, the earth must definitely belong to these people, right? The earth must belong to the me. So Jesus is right. Blessed are the me, for they shall inherit the earth. If you and I want to, to inherit the earth, then it is of necessity that we are meek. Remember, meekness is not weakness. But it can be misunderstood though. But weakness is never weakness. Meekness is a blessing. God bless us all. 
Good night and have a victorious weekend.